Half-Life 2, much like Half-Life before it, remains an iconic and important milestone in FPS history. Revolutionizing the implementation of natural physics in gaming, environmental storytelling with dynamic NPCs, this entry built upon the pillar that was the previous release with aplomb. Half-Life 2 remains one of my favorite shooters to date, nearly 16 years later. But one of the most important parts of growing as a person, and for media to improve in general, is to be willing to be critical of the things that you love. So today, I'll be talking about my least favorite part of Half-Life 2, a game I truly love, its ammo economy. This may sound like a weird thing to criticize in a single-player game, but when comparing the first and second Half-Life games, what I see is a massive step backwards specifically in regards to ammo management. In the name of streamlining the reloading and stocking up of weaponry, Half-Life 2 massively oversimplified its combat in a very unsatisfying way. When playing Half-Life 1, you'll have to run the math to think about who you want to shoot if you wish to live. Your guns have limited supplies, and ammo caches are few and far between. This is compensated for by a massive variety in said weapons, ranging from your bog-standard pistol, SMG, and shotgun, to the far more interesting alien weaponry and tactical trip mines or satchel charges. All of this is designed to make gameplay more complex than pointing and shooting. While you can get away with that if you're a good shot, you'll have a far easier time if you make use of your entire arsenal rather than a select portion. Meanwhile, in Half-Life 2, the weapon selection has been severely cut, but much to its credit, some of the new weapons introduced are incredibly inventive in their execution. We'll get to those soon enough, but that said, the vast majority of your arsenal, and the main focus on combat as a result, in theory, is based on more simple guns. Which is why it's a damn shame that these guns have been extremely dumb down in their functionality. Let me explain. If you've watched speedruns of first-person shooters before, you may have heard of the idea of backpack reloading. This is a glitch-turned mechanic in many a shooter, where if the player initiates a reload on a weapon, then swaps to a different gun, provided they wait out the length of the reloading weapon's full theoretical reload time, the gun will be ready to go upon pulling it back out. This lets you cut down on most downtime spent reloading by simply juggling between two guns, pulling out one while you let the other reload in your backpack. Half-Life 2's version of this is even more intentional and simpler yet. You don't have to start reloading a gun for it to passively reload when not equipped. All you have to do is swap to any other gun, and after 3 seconds plus the length of time the weapon you swapped off of would take to reload, upon swapping back you'll find it magically refilled with rounds and ready to go. Meaning you can go the entire game swapping between 2 or 3 guns without worrying about reloads. And even if you simply wish to stick with your favorite rifle, well, upon running out of rounds, your guns will automatically initiate their reload. This means a player could, in theory, play through the entirety of Half-Life 2 without ever once having to press the reload key, and not even really notice anything is wrong. Let's put that theory to the test. I'm gonna play through the game with reload fully unbound and see how difficult of a time I truly have, with the only way to refresh my clip being fully spending my current one or by swapping to another weapon in lieu of a reload. This isn't so much a challenge to show how talented I am as a player, I'd consider myself average at best, but how the streamlined shooter mechanics of Half-Life 2 oversimplify reloads to the point of a dedicated key for them becoming effectively unnecessary. Without further ado, let's wake up and smell the ashes. Obviously, until getting my hands on the pistol, this challenge of mine is no different from a regular run of the game. So we'll skip ahead to Root Canal, where an altercation with civil protection nets us our first gun. At this stage, not pressing reload is a bit trickier than you may expect, as if I need to refill, I either have to drain the magazine entirely or swap to my crowbar for the length of a standard reload. Still, seeing as all my opposition is only outfitted with small arms as well, the short reload interrupting combat really doesn't intrude. Things are going smoothly for the most part, so much so, I decided I need to up the ante. Right around acquiring the second gun, the SMG, I decided to raise the difficulty up to hard. I've played through Half-Life 2 so many times at this point that I know where supply caches and some shortcuts are hidden. I 
think I can handle it. Now we begin entering the gun juggling phase of gameplay, which is pretty much already how Half-Life 2 is played, only now more necessary. Empty an entire mag of pistol ammo, swap to the SMG, and by the time that stock is depleted, your pistol will have automatically reloaded in your pocket, so you can swap back and keep up the cycle. See, this example of gun juggling would be outright impossible to perform for long in Half-Life 1, as the pistol and SMG ingeniously share their ammo pool, meaning you have to consider their situational functionality and vary in some other arms to keep from running dry. Back in Half-Life 2, however, we're at no risk of drying out in water hazard. Before reaching the boat, though, we come across the main reason I made this video, these infinite ammo boxes. Let's break from the natural progression of the campaign for a moment to discuss. Half-Life 2's physics-based puzzles and necessary combat segments impose certain requirements on the player's armaments. I'll use Episode 2 as the most visually apparent example of this, but rest assured these puzzles are strewn all throughout the main game. A a floor panel with scorch marks underneath that flings objects upward when a grenade is detonated underneath. Now, imagine if you will, the player, with their halved ammo capacity of grenades from Half-Life 1, being Vive, finds themselves out of stock and is unable to complete the puzzle. Well, worry not, as an infinite supply rests nearby, giving the player all the grenades they could ever ask for, and plenty enough to finish the task at hand. Here's the thing though, grenades aren't primarily for puzzles, they tend to have combative purposes as well. Back to the main game here, if you give me an infinite supply of rockets, I'm going to abuse the rocket launcher, a spending spree with a blank check, and catching back up with my not pressing reload run here, an infinite SMG ammo crate is a sign that I can waste as much ammo as I desire with no unforeseen consequences. Obviously as I carry on ahead, the distance between my supply grows and I have to start being conservative with my ammo again. After all, it's not like the vehicle used throughout this segment has an ammo crate mounted on the back, that would be silly. <coughs> Seeing as the airboat doesn't have the mounted gun on it just yet, we'll skip ahead to one of the first major stops you take during Water Hazard, because as quickly as one supply crate diminishes, the game will grant you with another, or two, or three. This segment is basically a tutorial on grenades, but overcompensates on the idea in a way that feels very boring, compared to a similar area in Half-Life 1, where you're presented with multiple paths and options for eliminating enemies, even though grenades are obviously an intended solution. In an attempt to ensure the player can never find themselves completely foobarred, coming down to nothing but a crowbar in a steel corridor, Half-Life 2 supplements the player with infinite supplies. However, if this is already the case, what is the point of tracking down the Lambda caches? These little side areas are puzzles which reward the player with health, suit charge, and of course, ammo. Now, I'm not saying all ammo should be considered equally. Revolver ammo, of which you'll never find infinite supply crates for, obviously packs a much bigger punch than 9mm rounds. However, a little later into the game, we'll be granted some weapons which completely tilt the balance like a physics-based scale puzzle. But for now, let's get back to that revolver. This powerhouse of a weapon is only as good as the player's aim, one-hit headshotting most basic foes. Back in Half-Life 1, the revolver's main downside was its slow reload. However, Half-Life 2's backpack reloading mitigates this factor, showing no love for reloading during a battle. Still, it's only situationally useful and incredibly valuable when deployed correctly. We can talk more about small arms later, however, as we're now at the point where the resistance mounts a gun on your boat, which, by the way, uses the same sound Gary's mod uses for the tool gun. Sorry to ruin that for you. Now, this weapon I can really get behind. Not only does it take a bit of practice to use to good effect, but its ammo is limited by a cooldown timer, meaning you can go full auto to shred enemies in your path, but risk leaving yourself open for long stretches while it ramps back up. And the helicopter battle serves as an excellent conclusion to the overly long airboat trip. After making it to Black Mesa East, there's no need for weapons for some story beats, and reloading becomes an area concept for the fabled gravity gun. My favorite thing about Half-Life 2, and least favorite thing about its ammo economy. Let me explain. For those of you who may not have played the game for yourself, the gravity gun makes use of the Source Engine's physics-based props by letting you pick up objects from a distance then launch them at enemies for impact damage. It has no ammo and is only limited by the environment and the player's creativity. It serves as the perfect solution for large groups of enemies down corridors or a quick turnaround when low on ammo. It has a key dedicated to swapping to it and then swapping back to your previous weapon after all. So all of this sounds great, yeah? 
here's my problem. If one of the most iconic, original, and downright satisfying weapons in Half-Life 2 requires no ammo, aside from a barrel or toilet to launch, why does the game worry so much about supplying you with infinite bullets? The player who refuses to pick up any lambda caches spends every bullet they have and runs out of odds and ends props to fall back on, and runs too low on health to use the crowbar as a last resort, is a player who should be playing on a lower difficulty. I don't want to sound elitist when I say this. I absolutely love when games account for all kinds of players and their abilities, and have options to compensate for anything which may otherwise bar a player from partaking. But in Half-Life 2's case, a much better solution to worrying about players running out of any and all ammo to battle with would be a gun which doesn't run out of ammo, with some kind of limitation to stop it from being the only tool the player has to use, which the game has. Half-Life 1 even had this, in a way, with the Hornet gun, with the projectiles auto-aiming and your limited supply of 8 bugs passively replenishing. And that game was far less forgiving with its ammo economy. If you used up all your ammo, tough luck, either stick to your bees and bars or reload an older save. Frankly, this is a bit harsher than I'd actually like for a first playthrough, but if you take the time to look for ammo caches and rescue scientists or security guards to open supply cabinets, you'll certainly be well off. Jumping back to Half-Life 2, we've been welcomed to Ravenholm, and now I think we actually get a taste of the kind of ammo management balance between the first and second games that I'd like to see. I'll confess, I actually skipped the entire Black Mesa East chapter of my No Pressing Reload run here. It's entirely comprised of plot and a tutorial on the gravity gun. The footage on screen currently is from a normal run I already recorded, if you're wondering. What I mean to say is, I started a new game, still on hard, from Ravenholm, which also defaults your ammo counts to rather meager supplies, the kind of stock you would expect to see if you aren't keeping your eyes peeled for lambda caches. As a result, not reloading my weaponry wasn't much of a concern, as I didn't have the clips to spare. So, as you're expected to do, I blasted saw blades and explosive barrels through the majority of the segment. And don't get me wrong, that's not a bad thing by any means. In fact, Ravenholm still stands as one of my favorite parts of Half-Life 2. The ammo conservation, the puzzle solving with physics and environmental traps, the slow crawling zombies in the first half of Ravenholm aren't really designed to be opposition, they're designed to be experimentation. Seeing what creative ways you can use the environment and learn what tactics you can carry into the rest of the game. Things take a turn for the dangerous once fast and poison zombies are introduced, except at this point is when Father Grigori also grants you what I'd argue is the best gun in the game, the shotgun. A double barrel blaster 2 will handily deal with anything in your path. And now is when I started to find myself falling into the gun loop once again, and it never really resolves itself until the final chapter. Fire off 3 to 6 blasts with a shotgun, depending on the strength of my opposition, swap to the SMG, unload a mag, swap to the shotgun which has been fully, passively reloaded, and so on and so forth. All of this supplied by both lambda caches and, once you're outside Raven, home infinite SMG caches. To me, this isn't satisfying. I'd rather feel incentivized to make use of my entire selection of weapons as opposed to the easiest. But if you're going to keep giving me SMG and shotgun ammo, I'm gonna keep using it. Finally breathing in fresh air, the morning after a trip through hell. Now is when we pick up the Pulse Rifle, a weapon which fires insta-kill pulse balls, and also bullets I guess, and we finally find ourselves on the road to Nova Prospect. <sighs> Highway 17 is where all my issues with this game culminate. Mounted on the jeep we're driving is the Tau Cannon, an infinite weapon with admittedly middling damage designed for dealing with antlions more than the Combine. However, strapped to the back is a portable box of infinite SMG ammo. Now, I want to make something clear. By no means is the SMG the best of the best of weaponry. The secondary grenades, which cannot be found ad infinitum, are potent, particularly for sequence breaking if you know what you're doing, but the main gun itself isn't amazing. But it's certainly enough to kill one or two combine per clip. And with an unlimited supply of clips, so long as you keep on the move and minimize damage taken, it can certainly carry you through the entire game once acquired. So, my question is, why bother giving the car 
are an infinite gun, not even a limited by recharge one a la the airboat earlier, as well as infinite foot supplies. On top of this, the road is already lined with lots of pit stops, full of ammo and healing supplies to keep you charged. But what's the incentive to stop for ammo when you're provided an infinite supply? To enable a variety of weaponry beyond the SMG, of course, but these side stops also initiate combat of their own volition, so you'd be spending supplies to get supplies. I guess the idea is to effectively convert this SMG ammo into more suitable pulse rifle and shotgun rounds via lambda caches, but in all honesty, Highway 17 is a fairly short chapter if you don't stop at all. Exploring the side areas is fun, don't get me wrong, but more of an incentive should have been offered for their time, especially considering the questionable physics of the Jeep. If I didn't stop for any of the side areas, I'd end up with about the same amount of health, shields, and ammo at the end of the chapter as I did when I stopped at every single one. Back to the point, the camps you defend along the path as main story beats and first earn yourself the powerhouse rocket launcher are a far more creative and inventive use of time than some boxes of pistol ammo found in the side areas. These infinite rocket crates are an interesting note for me. They seem to be the most well thought out of the infinite ammo supply crates, typically placed out of the way or in dangerous areas to act as a trade-off for free rockets, seeing as they are a complete necessity to eliminate gunships unless you're extremely talented with a gravity gun, it makes complete sense to ensure the player can't find themselves dry, particularly as the launcher has a three rocket limit. All of this goes out the window at the bridge segment, however, the one with the combine force fields which you're tasked with disabling. While there is a gunship fight in this segment, they go absolutely ham with throwing out rocket crates three of these things in a row, and some extra rockets thrown around for good measure. I mean, if you're going to let me use a rocket launcher on mooks, I won't stop you, but it feels like cheating, doesn't it? Or maybe satisfying, depending on your point of view. Either way, being granted rocket and SMG crates throughout the drive to Nova Prospect, backed by an infinite Tau Cannon, is plenty to get one through until the sand traps. At this point, the goal is to avoid combat altogether, right up until the first antlion guard at the end. So, I take the time to secure supplies with a gravity gun across the beach, ideally to carry into the next stretch of the game. Once I've got the antlions in tow, I'll be going without supply crates for a hot moment as I've parked the car. And once again, this segment of breaking into the prison is one of the most memorable for me. Pinning targets with the pheromones and the twin gunships in the finale, not having a reload button isn't much of a concern for the rocket launcher as it's one shot to empty, thus auto-reloading. And the supply crate of rockets needed to destroy the ships and progress is well out into the open, and placed far after the last of the combine I faced. As a result, the most one will get out of this crate are the resources required to defeat the ships and move on. The way infinite ammo crates should should be used, as a guarantee of not being soft-locked rather than a crutch. So hey, I love the antlions, and the bug bait is a very fun idea for an item. That said, it was really cool to get to use the antlions for about five minutes before being crammed into the compact halls of the prison and having them suddenly become more of a nuisance than a boon, but that's not the point I'm making here. Juggling between the shotgun, SMG, gravity gun, and occasional grenades, things are pretty easy until meeting up with Alex. After some story beats, the game introduces the turret as a mechanic, once again removing agency from the player in terms of ammunition and converting it to agency over third parties. Between Half-Life 2's antlions, resistance fighters, turrets, and partnering up with Alex, the game really puts a lot of focus on the idea of spreading combat around between non-playable entities. And honestly, that's nothing but a good thing. Aliens and soldiers battling each other while security guards did dirty work for you, those were memorable mechanics of the original Half-Life, and seeing this expanded upon was assuredly satisfying. The downside being, these turret segments get incredibly tiresome. Giving me boxes of infinite ammo and a handful of centuries gets boring quick, hence my desire to skip. Especially the final of the three lockup holdouts, where only the basest level of care is needed to maintain the turret's torrents of terror. Now, we're going to skip ahead a bit, an entire week of teleporting in fact, and find ourselves back in City 17. Now, with an army in tow, we can march forth into the most open, combat that heavy segment of Half-Life 2. Of course, the very moment at which the gunplay would become the main focus is also when hopper mines are introduced, those mines which I'm meant to pick up and rearm with a gravity gun. I love these items in concept, but they take a bit too long to de- and rearm, and having civilians around makes them a hassle. Reload, Dr. Freeman. Absolutely not. You know, the longer I replay it, the more I realize how 
secondary, firearms really are in Half-Life 2. Obviously, it's still a first-person shooter, but just as important as shooting is the gravity gun, puzzles, and coordinating attacks through non-playable entities. Not to undermine the point of my video, but... Okay, yeah, actually, I will undermine it. The streamlining, and what I'll still argue to be over-streamlining, of Half-Life 2's ammo management does seem to be the result of rearranged priorities. If you haven't noticed, Half-Life games tend to be Valve's version of tech showcases. Half-Life 1 was all about in-world NPC interaction, puzzles, level design, so on and so forth. I made a video where I talk more about it, linked above and below. The most important thing, however, is the ways in which it revolutionized first-person shooter gameplay. Weapons, ammo management, the works. Half-Life 2, however, is all about the physics and refinement of mechanics brought in from Half-Life 1. However, in the several-year gap between releases, many in FPS took design cues from HL1 and ran with them. Half-Life 2 didn't need to focus as much on revolutionizing shooting mechanics, deciding to stick more closely to the refined 90s style implemented in the original release. No aim down sights, no tactical reloads. The series wouldn't choose to take a massive revamp to shooter mechanics until, well, Half-Life Alex, where the entry into virtual reality merited an overhaul in design. So what I think happened here was, instead of an overhaul to how weapons are used, Valve was more interested in what weapons were used. The gravity gun is a clear-cut example of this, perfectly showcasing the fancy physics of their new source engine. And at another stage in development, even more weapons would have been brought to the table to experiment with. I think that the passive reloads in Half-Life 2 are the aftermath of an earlier build of the game. To explain, Half-Life 1's weapon mechanics and lack of auto-reloading is seen by some, such as myself, as a layer of depth. However, others, completely fairly, find it annoying. Given how many weapons you acquire as you stroll through Black Mesa, uh, and if Half-Life 2 were to, say, have even more weapons in Gordon's <laughs> hammer space, perhaps auto-reload would have been fully required. And looking at content left on the game's cutting room floor, it's clear Half-Life 2 was originally going to feature a plethora of weird and wild weaponry, much of which the developers took the liberty of confiscating, simply for not being necessary, lack of development time, or being overpowered. However, if all these weapons were to be featured, or at least any number close to or higher than Half-Life 1's, the passive reloads would have made far more sense. Maybe, given the final version of the game we ended up with, some sort of more customizable difficulty would have been the way to go. The ability to disable passive reloading, for instance. Of course, for a game released in 2004, I wouldn't knock it for lack of more minute adjustability in the settings menu. The dev console, however, well, now we're onto something. If you enable this console in advanced settings, open it up and type sk underscore auto underscore reload underscore time you'll see the setting which allows for backpack reloading. It's set to a 3 second delay for reloading holstered weapons by default, however, what if we were to set that to 9999? This effectively disables backpack reloading, at least until the heat death of the universe or Half-Life 3 releases, whichever comes first. So now the gunplay will play a little more like that of Half-Life 1, with weapons not reloading until you do so yourself or run out of ammo in a clip. This isn't even a cheat command, it can be customized without losing access to achievements. I played with this a little bit myself, and honestly found the gunplay more satisfying. I had to think a lot more about what weapons I had access to and which were loaded at any given time. So if you, like me, find the passive reloading too simplified of a mechanic, well, there's no harm in disabling it. It's for sure how I'm going to play the game from now on. As for the infinite ammo crates, well, with the exception of the one infuriatingly mounted onto the back of the car, which already has its own infinite gun, <sighs> They don't really disrupt the flow of gameplay overall that badly particularly in the later segments of the game when you're facing off against major striders. The infinite rocket crates are placed in dangerous terrain, demanding more from the player to reach. And frankly, at this point in the game, ammo management has stopped being any kind of concern. The game doesn't care so much about how you defeat the Combine so much as that you do, using everything you've learned to fight back rather than resource manage. Unlike in Half-Life, where you and a handful of security guards are the only armed forces in this battle of monsters versus aliens, Half-Life 2 is about liberating a planet of invaders. You're not alone in this fight, so you shouldn't have to scrounge for your supplies. And as I've been talking, it seems we've made our way to the Citadel. At this point, all of Gordon's weapons are confiscated, and he's empowered with the super gravity gun, meaning reloads are no longer even a concept to consider. This, if anything, is an absolutely perfect analogy for Half-Life 2 as a game. It 
doesn't have complex shooter mechanics because it doesn't need to. It wasn't trying to be a revolutionary shooter, but rather a revolutionary game as a whole. And the approach Valve took to that was focusing on physics, in-world interaction, and NPCs. There's plenty of mods which overhaul the gunplay of Half-Life 2 to be more like one would expect from a modern shooter. But at the end of the day, the most memorable segments of the game will still revolve around the gravity gun, driving vehicles, solving puzzles, and searching for lambda caches. The guns aren't the focus. After all, you wouldn't need all that to empower Gordon Freeman. Thanks for watching, and take it easy.